Now, you know it isn't often, and I learned this since January, since I was had such an awesome, dramatic healing. It isn't often that we see miracles. Isn't that true? We read about them. We've read the gospel. Well, tonight there are two of us here. There's Father Stephen Shire, a dear friend, back with us, who had at least two big miracles. And my poor self, who had, I think, an awesome miracle. And, and I, I think it's a grace for all of you. Because Fire, Father Shire's miracle is one of dramatic healing of the soul and body. And so tonight, most of you have heard Father last year, but he's going to repeat what happened for those new stations and we're around the world now, so we want everybody in South America and Europe and Africa and China to hear the miracle of God's mercy. Please welcome back with us Father Stephen Shire. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to congratulate uh, Reverend Mother Brown, is that her name? Uh, on, on the, the ordination of her priest, her new order, and the the new status that she has of, of a, a public association of the faithful. And I think it's wonderful. Congratulations, and to all of you, Thank congratulations. You. Father, please refresh the memory of those who hear or heard you before with exactly what happened at the beginning and what is the the continuation of that awesome story. Okay, very, I'll, I'll be very glad to. In 1985, um, I was stationed in Southeast Kansas as a Dawson priest. And one day, October 18th, I decided to go to Wichita to get some advice from fellow priests about some things were happening in the parish. I left that day, went to Wichita, about 86 miles away on a very uh, treacherous highway, a highway that had no shoulders, that was traveled extensively by very heavy trucks and semis, and very hilly that went to the, semi, that went to the uh, Flint Hills. And coming back that afternoon from Wichita, I was involved in a head-on collision with a pickup truck from Hutchinson, Kansas, a city north of Wichita, and uh, was thrown from my vehicle, was unconscious at the scene, and uh, behind me uh, stopped a Mennonite nurse who assisted me in my hour of need until the ambulance uh, came from a nearby town of Eureka. And when they got there, she advised them, due to her expertise, that I had suffered a broken neck and to treat me accordingly. Uh, she didn't know the extent of the injury, naturally. The doctor in the town of Eureka uh, couldn't do much. He sewed the scalp back in my head my head, the scalp was, was ripped from the right side of my head over. And um, I had suffered uh, a concussion, they, they thought. Anyway, he called the Life Watch helicopter from Wichita. And the Life Watch helicopter came and picked me up. And upon liftoff, which I don't remember either, uh, he told his sister, who was a nurse at that time, he didn't expect me to live between there and Wichita. And it wasn't that far. I was taken to Wichita, Kansas, um, in, a, in a helicopter at to Wesley Hospital, a Methodist hospital, which makes no difference, um, and was admitted to the, uh, went to the trauma unit uh, initially, and then was admitted to intensive care. Um, I was in intensive care for uh, until December, uh, or until November, uh, the following November, but um, I was put into traction, was assigned a neurologist, and uh, one of my parishioners called from Fredonia that evening to find out how I was. I was told by one of the nurses that the doctors were giving me a 15% chance to live. Um, I was treated with morphine, put into traction, 
and the doctors decided not to do any surgery, any fusion of any broken bones. What was suffered at the scene of the accident was called a C2 break, which is a second cervical vertebrae, the same kind of break that a person that is hung suffers. He or she, when they're hung, asphyxiate. Had my head been turned either way at the scene of the accident, I would have died. Um, I was in the hospital, as I said, from October 18th until December 2nd. Um, during that time, I found out that my parish back in Fredonia uh, had that night opened its doors for prayer. People came that night uh, and offered their prayers for my recovery, my life. The Methodists uh, did the same. The Christian church in town did the same. The Baptists also. The Assembly of God minister told me that he spent the entire night in prayer for me. And I was on the midnight prayer line. I attribute my being here this evening before you to prayer. That is what I believe to be ecumenical. Uh, I was dismissed from the uh, hospital December 2nd. The doctors told me that uh, they didn't expect me to survive, but since I had, they wanted me to know uh, the, the, what they had thought that I would end up as. And um, it was rather startling even at that time. They said that had I lived, and apparently I did, <laughs> um, that I was to be on a breathing, that they thought that I should be on a breathing machine for the rest of my life, paralyzed, neck down, looking at the ceiling for the rest of my life, unable to speak. Uh, obviously, God had different reason, different purposes for me. Um, I was uh, went back to my parish um, the following May of the next year. My parish was left vacant by my bishop in Wichita, Kansas, and um, was celebrating mass that I thought to be a, a usual mass that day. When the gospel according to Luke came up, uh, a gospel which you've heard many times, a gospel which uh, spoke about the uh, owner of a vineyard coming out to inspect his vineyard. And uh, finding no fruit on the tree, he looked at his vine dresser and said, for three years now, I've come out here in search of fruit on this tree. I found none, cut it down. Why should it clutter up the ground? Uh, this page that I was reading from lectionary became enlarged. It was illuminated and actually came off the page toward me. I thought something was up, <laughs> and um, that something was very, very uh, special about this gospel because it almost was like a conversation I'd heard. I finished Mass the best I could, went back to my rectory, sat in my lounge chair, and then uh, it all came back very quickly. Shortly after the accident, um, I was before the judgment seat of Almighty God, His Son Jesus Christ, and our Lord very quickly went through my entire life, but most specifically, he uh, accused me of serious mortal sins that I had not had time to confess or to repent of. I thought I could take my time. Obviously, he had other reasons or other, other ideas. When he finished, he said, your sentence is eternal hell. There was no surprise. I said, yes, Lord. I know. Because when you're talking the truth himself, there are no excuses. Everything he said was true. Uh, there were no excuses at all. He was merely honoring my choice. I had made the choice. He was merely saying, okay, you can have what you want you know, eternal damnation. And I would say, yes, Lord, thank you. I didn't say thank you, but I said, yes, Lord. Uh, right after that, a female voice I heard, see, I didn't see him, but I heard him. But a female voice I heard say, son, will you spare his life and his mortal soul? He said, mother, he's been a priest for 12 years for himself and not for me. Let him reap the punishment he deserves. He said, but son, if we give to him special graces and then see if he bears fruit, if not, your will be done. 
There was a short pause. Then I heard him say, Mother, he's yours. Precious. I'm here. And uh, that was a little over 12 years ago. She has been mine, and I have been hers, both supernaturally and naturally. And I don't know what I did without her before that. Uh, I didn't have any special devotions to her before that time. I do now. And my life as a priest has been dramatically changed. And uh, I realize that to become the priest that God wants me to be is going to take an entire lifetime, an entire life, that one does not do this in a month, a year, or five years. Uh, our Lord said, you must be perfected as my heavenly Father is perfect. That applies to priests too. I found out uh, since then that my mission uh, is to come back, or if I speak in that way, to come back and tell people that, number one, hell exists. It does exist. And that priests are liable to it. You wonder how, though, uh, some of the people in the audience are asking, how could a priest deserve hell? We are under the same commandments as anybody else. There are ten commandments. If any of those are broken, we have to go to confession. We've sinned. We've sinned grievously against the Lord. Uh, priests can sin grievously against the Lord, too. The white piece of plastic that a priest wears in his collar does not guarantee him heaven. We have to work as hard and sometimes even harder than the average Catholic. This because we are accountable for more because uh, we give you advice on how to live. We are representatives of his church. We speak about what he taught. And uh, therefore, uh, we are very much accountable. Uh, people don't think that, but, but we are. You, you, you know, we are accountable. They think that we're automatically guaranteed salvation. We're not. We're not at all. You have to follow the rule of holiness, huh? That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. But you know what amazes me, Father, when you were facing God and he gave you that awesome, terrible judgment. You know, your, your judgment is hell. You seem so calm about it. Is that, is that a part of death? That was uh, a part of uh, the, the judgment that I, it was just a matter that I accepted. You know, it was truth. Mm -hmm. I knew it even before he said it. You know, even before he said it, it was, it was logical that he, that he uh, come to that conclusion. So it wasn't a shock at all, you know, it wasn't a shock at all. And, and you accepted it. Exactly. I suppose everybody must do that. I think we all do it. Yeah. And I had planned otherwise. I had a lot of excuses. But obviously, it didn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Because he knows, he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows the ins and outs. And he will not accuse us of anything that we're not guilty of. I yeah. found that out. You must have, uh, because that's a miracle, but t tell us about, the, did you have a lot of pain? Did, I mean, you were healed and you should not be sitting there. E even if our Lord said, okay, he's yours, Physically, is that not also a miracle? Yes, it was a miracle that I lived. The Blessed Mother interceded for my life. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was up to our Lord to pull the plug, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He didn't do that. He was very merciful. He let me live. He not only spared my eternal uh, soul, but he spared my life as well. And uh, that is a double miracle in my books, you know. Um, we read in the gospel, we hear in the gospel, you know, uh, the story of that person who ate at the table and Lazarus was underneath the table and uh, he asked for the same thing. He didn't get it. You know, ha have me come back or have somebody come back and tell my brothers that this place does exist. He said, hey, if they won't listen to the prophets, Abraham said, they won't listen to anybody else either. They want to come back from the dead even. But here, here I am, you know, I, 
never in my wildest dreams would I have ever thought that I was, uh, would be a subject to his mercy, mm -hmm. this kind of mercy. Well, we, we know that, that you feel an obligation uh, to tell everybody there is a hell, and if you live in mortal sin, your chances of going there are, are, are very good. What other thing do you want to tell us? There, uh, I feel, have felt since day one, there is more to my testimony than this. Um, this is part of it. Uh, I was commissioned or missioned, so to speak, to come back and, and uh, you know, if, I, if it's possible to speak in this way, then this is exactly what I have to do. To, uh, to give testimony to the fact that the church and maybe the clergy have to be reformed. Um, this uh, is an awesome task and um, one which I don't relish. And uh, it's something which I can't say, why me? Mm -hmm. Because I've often thought, you know, uh, why, was I so why was I so fortunate and how can I say thank you? Well, with every grace, with every blessing, there is an obligation. And apparently this is it. And I gladly, gladly do it out of love for him and for my brother priests too and my brothers and sisters in Christ who are followers of Christ. And about what I'm going to say, uh, does, it doesn't mean that, that I was never guilty of such actions, omissions, um, neglect. Um, it just means that these are areas that need to be pointed out, that need reformation in the church today worldwide. That's the important uh, context, worldwide. Not United States only, worldwide. <coughs> um, some of the areas that I have to discuss or focus on are um, areas that, that you know and, and are, are, are very well aware of. Um, the first is in the area of auricular confessions. Auricular confessions are, are just confessions. The sacrament of reconciliation. That has not been uh, talked about in the pulpit, encouraged, so to speak, from priests who are in the pulpit. And once a person goes to confession, oftentimes he or she is told, you're going to confession too often. You know, don't come that often. You know, every two weeks is often for some, in, some, in some priest's eyes. Uh, and then, too, uh, when a person or penitent confesses sins, he or she is often told, well, that's not sinful. Uh, and I, I am a product of this. I, I know this for a fact. I've been a recipient. One is told uh, when one confesses serious, sinful, uh, moral sin, well, you, you know, you're not guilty of that. Uh, you were tired, you know, uh, under anxiety and tension, and you're not guilty. Uh, oftentimes, too, I blame psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, psychologists will tell people privately and publicly, don't feel guilty. Why should you feel guilty? Because your parents are responsible for the way you are. Or your environment made you the way you are. You shouldn't feel guilty. Consequently, why should one go to confession if one does not feel any guilt? There's no need. So therefore, a lot of people don't go to confession anymore. They, they don't, just don't feel guilty anymore. They've been told that by the media too. Uh, but priests, uh, too, you know, have, have, have been a part of that, unfortunately. And uh, this is seen, too, in the area of uh, young people uh, when they learn how to go to confession. Uh, they're not taught uh, the Ten Commandments to go through to examine one's conscience. Uh, very few know the laws of the church. And uh, p uh, young people, the CCD age, uh, do not even know the difference between mortal and venial sin, or there are two kinds of sin, you know, generally speaking. Uh, they don't know the act of contrition either. This I know from experience. Um, uh, the, the opinions of priests 
two uh, are a, a major cause of the, uh, the decline in confessions, opinions. When a priest uh, gives an opinion, his own personal opinion, he should take off the collar because he is an ordained minister of the church. He teaches what the church professes, what the church teaches. He is an ordained minister of the Catholic Church. To say anything else is his own opinion. And consequently, a lot of priests are leading a, a lot of faithful astray because they're preaching their opinions, not only in the confessional, but in the pulpit. Um, one of the reasons uh, to, to uh, kind of put the icing on, on, on stuff, not talk about things that are, that are generally important is that we don't run ruffle, ruffle any feathers out there. Um, priests do not want to make their parishioners feel guilty. They especially do not want to make a person who writes big checks guilty. They want people to leave the church saying, as, as they leave to the priest, Father, that was a good sermon. Good sermon. Consequently, you know, peace, love, and joy those are what's talked about predominantly, not, not matters of faith and morals. Uh, God's justice, hell, confession, you know, these are not talked about. Um, and then, too, the, the decline of uh, paraliturgical services in parishes, prayer services. Used to, and all of us can remember, or at least most of us anyway, the times in a parish when novenas were very in, uh, other liturgical services, paraliturgical services like rosaries, uh, benediction, perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. These are out. Uh, why? Well, because if you pick up a, a, a certain type of document in some parishes, you will read of all the organizations uh, that that parish has. And uh, these organizations are to help people who have problems to deal with them. The single and the divorced, the widowed, the alcoholic, all these things, you know, you, people get together at the, for socials, they find out that other people share the same problems. But what this is saying is prayer is useless. Let's have an organization to meet the need. Because these are what's in, what can help. And oftentimes these are no more than uh, socials, where people get together and socialize and, and see that there's other people suffering the same problems as they are. And uh, this is not working. Um, in the name of ecumenism, uh, a lot is being done to the churches on the inside that is atrocious. The uh, taking out of statues in churches, the taking out of kneelers, the uh, placing to the side the tabernacle or in another room uh, uh, sometimes, and the, the priest in the presidential chair as the focal point right now of the liturgy. He's right in the middle. Father is right in the middle, not Jesus. Jesus cannot be seen anymore. Not important. Uh, a cross and not a crucifix. Why? Because that offends our Protestant brethren. Uh, the crucifix, they'll say, why do you have the corpus on the cross? He's risen. You know, it's an empty cross. That's true. But to see, to see you know, it gives us a different message to see the, the, the body of Christ on the cross, how much he suffered for us. But no more. Vigilites are out uh, to uh, the Stations of the Cross. All these things, theater seats to are in. And uh, with regards to uh, the interior uh, acclamation of, of, of the faithful and the priest too, uh, to different uh, gestures, kneeling or genuflecting is out. A bow toward the Blessed Sacrament is sufficient. Genuflecting is wrong, is out, and standing during the consecration is now in, in some parishes. 
uh, all these things are atrocious. Another area that I had to talk about is the support of priests for priests. Uh, in a lot of dioceses, that's not true anymore. In the, the 1950s, one heard from priests that the priesthood was the greatest fraternity in the world. Not anymore. You don't hear that. The two, there, there's a game that priests play, really two ways of playing it. One is, if Father is doing a good job, the other priests say, what's he trying to prove? What does he want? If he fails, minutely or majorly, they say, see, I told you so. What do you expect from a person like that? And uh, the, the paradox of such situations or such dioceses is that in these dioceses, and every, every diocese has them, there, there is what is called a priest priest. A person that a priest can go to who has a lot of problems, as somebody who is compassionate, who is understanding, who knows how to treat priests, and who other priests go to for advice. Um, the last area is CCD. And I've talked a little bit about it. But the kids today, since the uh, 70s, uh, the 60s and 70s, are not being prepared for uh, the Catholic faith. The, the, the textbooks for, for children who do not go to parochial schools, uh, religion classes are lacking and lacking extremely in doctrine, in the teaching of the church and morality. Um, in the 70s, I looked at one a particular CCD text that was in our school, and it had a picture of a smiling Jesus on one page, and on the other in bold print, Jesus loves you. You turn the page. That's what the children were learning. Not the commandments, not the dogmas or, or, or the, the doctrines of the church, you know, not how to make a good confession. And uh, I was approached when I uh, said that it was obligatory that uh, the children who make First Communion should learn the first, should memorize the commandments. It was an exercise in futility, I was told by the parents of this one child. A, uh, a memorization, memorization, I was told, was out. And as I explained, you know, this was the way that the child could go through and examine her conscience, you know, later on. And uh, I, I finally got that uh, point across to the parents, you know. But these are the things that, are, that, are, that are, I feel are hurting the church today. There's a lot of other things, but these are things that I know I'm supposed to address. Uh, how long will God put up with them? I'm not a prophet. How, how long will he wait until uh, we, we come to our senses, so to speak? I know this. And as Mother has said, he's very merciful. He is patient. But he's patient in one regard only, and only for one reason. He wants all of us to be saved. He wants all of us in heaven with him. And if it means waiting until we come to our senses, that's exactly what his patient is, is telling us, especially in this regard. That's a great mission, Father, because we need to be reminded. You know, years ago, well, not too many years ago, say 30 years ago, the thought of abortion was an abomination to everybody. Now they've become accustomed to it. I mean, they're scandalized, they're horrified, but we're, uh, what I fear is that we're getting so accustomed to error, mm -hmm. to lukewarmness, that we don't notice it. And I think that's why what you're doing now is important. Because the network, the purpose of the network is not only to teach, but to warn the people, you know, we're kind of getting lukewarm. There is a God. There is a judgment. We're, we're, we're sure of two things, death and taxes. Everything else will come or go, but those things, and you know for sure. Yeah, that's my dad used to say, too. <laughs> There's one thing for sure. All of us, every one of us, will have to stand one day like Father Shire. And you really can't count that Our Lady's going to intercede for you. I hope she does. I hope she does for all of us. 
But I think Father Shire's experience was most unusual and for a purpose. And I think his witnessing to that tonight is one purpose. And the second purpose is, I think, to remind us, to remind the church, to remind priests, religious, and lay people, think, and let's get back. Let's be Catholic. Well, we're going to let you uh, call in just a minute and, and ask your questions to Father Shire, and we'll be back. We're back with Father Shire, and we heard that awesome. You know, I think the first time Father came, we played that two or three times a week for months. And the reason was I wanted you to know there is a hell. <laughs> I think we all suspect there is, but Father's witness proved there is. And we have a call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Drake at Massachusetts, Mother. That's wonderful. Now, what is your question? My question, well, first of all, I want to thank you for being you. <laughs> thank you. And I love Father Shire. <laughs> I've heard him before, and the first time I heard him, there was something that he said that I needed to know, and I kept asking the Lord, if I ever have a chance to write to him, I want to ask him this question. When Our Lady spoke the woman's voice, and she said, if we give him special graces, now, I'm so imperfect. Do I have to get close to death in order to get these special graces? How did you get these special graces? What did she mean by that? Um, there are a lot of things uh, that I've reflected on in the last 12 years that I consider special graces. But uh, to answer your question, uh, you do not have to wait until death. The Blessed Mother is anxious to, to give them to you. And sometimes all you have to do is ask. But if you don't ask, don't worry about it, because she's your mother, and she knows the best for you, and she's going to give them to you. Well, what were some of them, Father? Some of the graces? Yes. Um, some messages sometimes. Ah. Uh, people that came into my life that, that got messages for, from her uh, who said they had messages for me from her, uh, and they, they, are, they are authentic. Mm -hmm. I, I believe, truly believe they are. Um, the fact that I was able to enter the Intercessors of the Lamb, um, which was uh, an icing, so to speak, on top of the cake, uh, I never believed or dreamed I would be able to, to do this, to join a community that intercedes for priests, a contemplative community that intercedes, and we pray for everybody, but we pray especially for priests, and uh, priests we need to pray for very especially. Mm -hmm. I would suppose the grace of changing your entire life would be great, huh? Exactly. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the Mass means more to me is a very special grace. Uh, the, 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 this very special grace of realizing that, that the goal that is important is heaven. There's no other. And that sometimes priorities are mixed up, especially here on earth. This is a shadow world. The real world is heaven. And there's nothing or no one worth losing heaven over. That's what I have come to believe and find, found out very especially, that there is no one or no person, or, or no, no, no thing worth losing heaven over. I think we ought to all remember that. And maybe we need to repeat it. Do you repeat that, Father? I, I have come to believe, Mother, that, that uh, in my experience of having almost lost heaven, that there is nothing on earth, no one or no, no, no thing worth the loss of heaven over. And, and I read that scripture where our Lord says, 
What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul in the process? I know exactly what he was talking about. I know exactly what he was talking about. That's awesome. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Hi, I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. Wonderful. And what's your question? Well, I, I, I have a question that's kind of a, it's a comment, Mother, that you've made in the past that at some point we will know that our Lord is really present in the Eucharist, in the tabernacle, and yeah. we seem to have lost. I had, a, had an experience with this uh, at a church in Illinois, but I wanted to tie it into, into my question for Father Shire. He had mentioned last year when he was on that one thing that he was certain of when he had come out of his, you know, his accident, and he was, you know, gained his, regained his consciousness, that the, the one thing that he was certain of is that, if, you know, Jesus, the angels, uh, Blessed Mother, and the saints, and that, you know, he was more certain of them, and that it was you and I that lived in the shadow world, and if he could just expand on that a little bit, then I have a comment. What I, what, I, uh, what I meant at the time and what I still mean is the fact that oftentimes our life here on earth is geared toward goals and opportunities that are presented to us and these take precedence over everything else. The Blessed Mother at Medjugorje mentioned in one of her messages that nothing should come before her son Jesus. Nothing or no one. This is exactly what she was talking about. Oftentimes we can lose consciousness or of, of our priorities. And uh, our only priority, our only priority, I found out, is being with God forever, for all eternity. That nothing gained here on earth can compare with and is lasting. That what's here is gone tomorrow it's it, that, in that in that regard it's a shadow world you know uh sometimes up here we think you know well when life's over behind the mortuary car will be a u-haul <laughs> and i'll take everything with me wrong <laughs> the thing that impressed me the most and that i i thought about most when i came back was most shocking was that our Lord relied on no other opinion, none other, than it was just he and I. Nobody else was involved. He and I. He knew me. The, the person that I should please is him, and no one else. And this is a great lesson, too. We all go through life trying to please somebody. We become not ourselves, but somebody else in trying to please the other person in doing what they want us to do. Where the priority should be, it doesn't make a difference. They're not going to be with us with judgment. He's going to be the one that counts. He's the one that knows me. And I don't have to play any games with him. I, had, I, can only, I can be myself. He loves me more than I'll ever know. Ever. And when I stand before him in judgment, uh, I don't have to play games and tell him what he wants to hear because he knows already. Lord, I'm sinful. Depart from me. That's pretty much how you feel when you're in his presence. He says, come here. I love you. I love you. Come, let me embrace you. Sometimes here on earth we lose sight of that. And that's what I mean to say, this is a shadow world. Thank you. We have another call. Hello? Hi, how are you doing, Mother? Fine, dear. What's your question? Uh, well, my question is, Father, and I want to make a comment, Father, your, your witness there is incredibly powerful. And uh, I'm, it's just the impact. I can't tell you how much you're, you're talking right to me, and I think to every one of us. But at any rate, I want to ask you, you mentioned that Confessors sometimes give erroneous advice or uh, to penitents uh, in the confessional. And if you're in a gray area and you're going to a priest for advice, and it's a complicated gray area, it's not just as easy as, you know, shall I uh, <coughs> steal this apple today or not. It's, you're, you're working in a complicated area and you really need some advice. 
and the priest gives you improper advice um, that, caught, that may be sinful, and you may act on that. Um, who's responsible in that case? Are you responsible then for that sin because you acted on that advice, even if you thought, well, maybe he's not right, but the priest did say this, so I will go ahead. Um, that That's kind of a... a I guess a uh, very questionable thing. Um, would you be responsible at the time of judgment? Also, one quick question after that. When you said, when you're in his presence, when you died, it, you felt, Lord, I'm sinful, depart from me. When, you, when he rendered that judgment, did you also feel any part of the great mercy, the great love? You know, as you said, he loves us more than we can ever imagine. Did you feel any of that, or did you feel a loss that it was there, but you couldn't have it? I mean, how? what did you feel coming from Jesus at that time? Thank you. Depending, or uh, with regards to your first question, it depends on how much you know as a penitent, but the priest is responsible for the uh, advice he gives to a penitent, because more people listen to the advice of priests. A priest is in the know. He should know. He is a professional. You know, he is ordained as a minister of the church and therefore, you know, uh, should give correct advice. Uh, it depends on the, the, uh, the amount of knowledge that the penitent has, though. If he, know, if he suspects anything else, he, should go to another, or he or she should go to another priest. Uh, when I have gotten bad advice to a confession or something has been missing, I go, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, say, Father, you're wrong. You know, why don't you do it this way or t tell me what I'm supposed to hear. I, I go to another priest and go to confession. I get absolution. I get peace of soul. To answer your second question, um, I felt God's mercy when he said, Mother, he's yours. I felt his justice when he said, gave me my sentence. And that doesn't mean he was not merciful or loving. It just meant that his justice uh, said exactly, uh, or, or uh, re-echoed the way I had been living, period. Did you feel a, a sense of loss? No, mother, I didn't. You, you felt that it was a just sentence then? Yes. You, you were ready to, to suffer the punishment? Yes. But it had to be also. Did that ever come back to you? Very much. Hmm. I bet it would. Scare you to death. It does. It <laughs> <laughs> almost. <laughs> Scare me to death. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I think you, you can't forget something like that. You no, know? you can't. <laughs> there has been a day can't. past since this happened that I have not thought about it. Mm -hmm. And you have to also have to be so grateful to Our Lady's intercession. Huh? Yeah. And uh, my gratitude has not been expressed adequately, I believe. You know, mm -hmm. no matter what you do, what you say, it doesn't seem adequate, you know. Oh, yeah. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel that way in uh, thanking our Lord for, I don't know, he's always doing something awesome, you know, for this network. And for the people, I know, I know the network is for the people, just like my healing is for, was for the people. How, ca how can we work towards changing? Maybe we need to ask for self-knowledge, huh? Did you have self-knowledge when you died, do you think? I disregarded it, Mother. I had it, but I disregarded it. Ah, that's different. That's huh? different. Yeah. Uh, the adage is, know yourself. And he helps us know ourselves. But he can't make us do with that knowledge what we're supposed to do because we have free will. Uh, well, didn't you go to confession? Yes, uh, I did when I wanted to. Because hmm. I had lots of time. You thought you had lots of time. Yes. How old were you? At the time, uh, let's see, I'm 52 now. This was 12 years ago. I was, uh, you know, about 40. Old enough, no bad. Very, very much. <laughs> very much. <laughs> very much. 
Well, if you went to confession, that's what I don't understand. I'm not going to ask him this. Uh, <laughs> 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 what, what, <laughs> I mean, did you say everything or you just said what you thought you should? Um, I said everything, but I had not had a chance to go to confession for quite some time. Ah. So I was guilty of, of unconfessed sins wow. and unrepented mortal sins at the time. But see, the, the thing is that, that um, you know, one time this woman was bringing me to a hospital. This is, oh, I can't remember how many years ago. She was bringing me to the hospital. It was after my, one of my operations for treatment. And, uh, and she was talking, and she turned the corner. And all of a sudden, I saw on the mirror, I mean on the front on the window, the side window, the radiator of this big bus. And I knew I wasn't going to need a treatment, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and that bus turned up on the sidewalk. Mm. But what got me, Father, was I never thought of Jesus. I didn't think of me, my sin. All I thought of was that radiator's here, mm -hmm. and I'm finished. And, and isn't that true? You can't wait till that last minute. Right. Uh, the Mennonite nurse told me, who stayed with me at the time, that I was trying at the, at the, at the time to say the, the Hail Mary. And I was told that at midnight, I was still saying, uh, saying the priest said I was, he thought I was talking in tongues but uh, I was trying to say the Hail Mary. Now, the last part of the Hail Mary is all of us know is, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. She's the intercessor. What I was saying was, Mary, come to my aid. Yeah. I didn't know I was saying that, but that's exactly what I was telling her. Wow. Well, Holy you Mary. You weren't conscious of praying. Not that I know of. Apparently, I was conscious enough in my unconsciousness to have her act. Wow. It shows we, we don't appreciate the power of Our Lady. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Well, well how, do you, how do you feel now, Father? Um, in what regard? Well, let's take ordinary sins, okay? I'm not talking about big ones. I'm sure you don't have big ones anymore, but you know, you get impatient. You, you, sometimes you want to hit somebody on the head with a banana, or mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> little things like that. You know, mm -hmm. I, do, do 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 these mean more to you now than they did before? Much more. I'm very much more conscious now of uh, my sinfulness mm -hmm. than I was before, um, and I realize, and I've asked, you know, the Lord to take away certain things. And uh, I, used the, the, I used to think it was terrible, but it's, maybe it's not so terrible. Uh, he won't do it. I say, Lord, you know, give me patience. What he will do will send me to somebody who I can either be patient or impatient with. I flunk every time. <laughs> Shake, Mother. Shake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is how, he, this is how he, he operates with me, you know. It's like St. Paul, Lord, take away this weakness. He says, no, in weakness, my power reaches perfection. And uh, this is how it is with me. I, I'm very well aware of my weaknesses, but he said, he said I will not uh, let you carry these beyond your ability, you know. And he says, I'll always be there to help you, you know. Uh, come to some type of righteousness, some type of, of rightness, yourself, because you can do it. Father, we got a half a minute. Give us a blessing. Sure. May the blessing of mighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend Amen. upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, we have one minute and 15 seconds. Just enough to say. <laughs> if you're planning on dying soon. <laughs> And you have no place to put all that money you got. Here we are. <laughs> and remember, when you face the judgment seat of God, you have nothing there but you. And that's what amazing to me. It's amazing to me that a million people 
could die at the same time. But you face the judgment seat of God alone. Alone. And these are some hard truths, but they're very wonderful truths. If we live right, well, we may have a little purgatory like we talked about last night, but I think purgatory is a consolation. As you're going to purgatory, you can say, Alleluia, I made it. And that's what we should all do. At least we have seen God and we have seen him in an awesome way. I love you and we'll see you next week.